welcome to episode number 45 of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. I'm your host, Kent Rourke. I'm honored and privileged to be able to do this episode tonight about uh, one of my good friends when I was in the POA club, and that is uh, Julian Nemers. We all know him as Doc Nemers in POAs. He was in Dubuque, Iowa, and then later Hazel Green, Wisconsin. He's owned hundreds of POAs over his lifetime and bred for some of the greats. He's one of the leading breeders of all time. So we're going to get right into it and uh, talk about the family and how he started in POAs a little bit, and what motivated him, and then some of the blood he put into POAs and some of the horses he used uh, to help push the POA breed along. So we do have a lot of sponsors tonight because uh, Doc is such a great man. A lot of people wanted to be part of this. So we have... Uh, Two supreme sponsors tonight, Bruns Performance Horses, and then Dr. Chocolate, a stallion that is related to Nemers. That's why his name is Dr. Chocolate. He's in uh, Wisconsin. We'll be talking about him. And then we have uh, three ROM sponsors and, of course, Jackson's Auto Family that we're coming live at their facility here at uh, Studio B, or Studio J, I'm sorry. We don't have a B yet. Studio J uh, in Enid, Oklahoma. So if you're looking for a Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram, GMC, uh, Buick, or Chevy down in Kingfisher. We have two stores, Jackson's, and of course we have a couple lots full of used cars. So we're going to start out tonight talking about uh, Doc Nemers. He grew up, of course, and he was Julian Nemers as his uh, given name, and he ended up being an orthopedic surgeon. So when he started naming his POAs in the mid-70s, he went with the Doc's prefix. And uh, some people have used it over the years with his permission, but if you check in the stud books, most of them are, uh, was either registered by him or bred by him. So this is uh, young Julian here. This is before he's a doctor, of course, I'd hope so. And uh, look at that little pinto pony. So Jackie, his daughter, told me a story today via messenger that uh, Doc wanted a pony really bad when he was a kid and his mom and dad wouldn't give him a pony wouldn't let him have a pony so there was a guy in the neighborhood that would let him ride it was a nickel to ride around the block so I guess Doc said someday he was gonna have his own pony and he ended up with hundreds of them and some of the best registered POAs like I say that there's been and uh, this this is a kind of cool story that that's how it started out so uh, Doc and his first wife Jen raised uh, six kids in the POAs all six of them uh, we're in POAs, and of course they're Jackie, Julian Jr., Carolyn, Kathy, Ellen, and John's the youngest. So two boys and four girls. They all showed POAs. You see the older three up top there, and the younger three on the bottom. I love this ad, uh, the present and the future. And of course, all of them won a lot of stuff, and they showed uh, main. They showed in Iowa, but they showed a lot of national shows. And uh, we're going to show some of the uh, POAs that they showed as youth. This is Jackie Nemers. A lot of people remember her uh, as a youth. And then also, she spent a lot of her adulthood uh, helping Doc with his breeding program uh, throughout the 90s, basically. And uh, she was almost like his breeding manager. She would uh, set things up and call people. And, and things like that. I got a real quick story, a couple personal stories about Doc and Jackie over the years. I'll get to those later if time permits. So uh, again, if you don't see all the pictures uh, of a horse that you sent in or a POA you sent in, we have about 70 some pictures tonight. I just can't get them all on here and the show would go so long. I could talk about the Wheeling Colts Doc bred for one podcast, the broodmares he retained uh, for one, the champions he raised, his family. I could do five podcasts on Dr. Julian Nemers, and I'm just going to do one two-hour podcast. So bear with me. We're going to go through some of this fast, faster than I'd maybe like. But uh, this is a young Jackie Nemers with Doc, uh, with uh, Joe Barr. Joe Barr was a three bars bred POA. He was very modern. Uh, a lot of alumni this week have said how fast he was. I guess he was one of the top barrel horses of his day. A lot of the Nemers kids rode him. He was also a grand champion gilding at the international show. And uh, that's Jackie showing him there, of course. And he was just a good-looking uh, POA, Joe Barr. 
Here is Julian Nemers Jr. And he's riding Little Man's Image here. And of course, Julian grew up to be an equestrian. Uh, he had a lot of success in the Appaloosas in Colorado, and he's shown other breeds as well, of course. And uh, he's considered a you know, well-respected trainer. Uh, he's getting uh, up there in years now as a trainer, probably. I'm not sure if he's still training a lot or if he's retired. Uh, Doc, by the way, is 94 right now, and he stopped breeding uh, a few years ago, quit uh, raising POAs uh, just lately. So he, uh, he was, had POAs from the 60s up till uh, the late teens here. So this is Julian Jr. Here's Carolyn, and this is one of their POAs. Uh, this is, I think, Danny's Crockett, I believe. Yep, this is Danny's Crockett. You'll see him again. I uh, thank so Jackie uh, Nemers for giving me some of these good pictures. Some of them I found in the magazines and stuff. Here she is again. And Jackie said a lot. All the kids learned how to ride on this POA. This is WM's Mighty Mouse. And I never even knew about this POA until... Uh, yesterday or today. I did know about some of the others that the kids rode. Here's Kathy. I got to know Kathy and Jackie, both uh, the most of the six kids. And uh, of course, there's Joe Bar again in Hutchison, Kansas. And this is, I believe, Kathy again. I'm clicking on your comments to see everyone's comments too, so... Tracy's on board. Chris Jules there. Joe Barr could run pretty fair raining pattern. He could slide and spin. Yeah, that's that's what Chris Jules said. So here is 7M's Warriors Bonnet with Ellen Nemers. Of course, they had 7M's Bonnet a long time, Warriors Bonnet. Uh, Doc liked the ladies' warrior bloodline. When he started breeding, that's the stallion he chose to breed was one of the first stallions he, he bred to Bob Moser's Ladies Warriors uh, stallion. And then uh, later on, he used some of his mares in his program. Okay, so this is uh, Danny's Crockett again. And this is John. He's the youngest. And then here's John as a teenager on Joe Bar. So Joe Barr was around a long time. Jackie showed him all the way down to John. And you see John's almost a grown man in this picture. Uh, Joe Barr was just u really unique. And I think that's one of the reasons Doc liked the, the quarter horse blood and the thoroughbred blood. He would put a lot of blood in his program, horse blood, all the way up to the end. He introduced some horses that we all know now is pretty common in the POA breed. And Doc is the one that introduced quite a few of those. Here's an example here, of course, the famous Goldenrod Pony Farm from Iowa. They had GR's Mini Bar as a baby, and it shows right there. Dr. Nemers purchased it for $11.50, and they'd end up showing her, and they also used her as a broodmare. And look at this, for an early, she was in the 60s, and her sire was a double-A rated quarter horse named Mr. Johnny Bar, and he was an own son of three bars. So that early, uh, Doc purchased a three bars POA, and uh, he ended up breeding this. I think the, the first docks registered in the stud books, anyway, is in 1974, uh, a daughter of this filly named Docks Barbell, and it's by uh, Tips Polecat, who was a Leo grandson. He was a snowcap Appaloosa. So Doc was really going for the blood there, and then he ended up using that mare uh, for, in his broodmare program once he established a, a pretty large program. Okay, so... The Nemers, like I say, they were showing a lot, and uh, they were a pretty well-known family in the POA club in the 70s, and Max Nebergall was one of Doc's friends, and they remained that way for uh, Max's whole life, and this is Max standing in the middle there, and that's East Acres Tough to Beat that he sold the Mitchells uh, to California, and then that's Julian Jr. holding Double Tough. This would have been in 76. Uh, Max Hardship Double Tough, we've, we've talked about him quite a bit on these shows and showed him in 1975 in Colorado 
He won Grand Champion Stallion there. Shortly after that show, or maybe even at that show, Max approached Doc, and Doc ended up buying him for a large mount for Julian, since Julian was a you know a tall young young man showing still uh, 18 and under. So Double Tough became his mount, but he was still a stallion, and Doc left him a stallion. Max was afraid somebody else would buy him and make him a show gilding, and it's good for the POA breed that Doc did buy him, and that they did. Uh, continue to show him and he became uh, the game changer in the POA breed. He's the one that flipped it from uh, the pony look to the little horse look, in my opinion, a lot of other people's opinion. So this is him standing grand for the second time. This would be in 76, but the first time with the Nemers family and young Julian was his shower. He, he exhibited him when he won grand in 76 and 77 out in California. And here's Julian riding Double Tough. Remember, it was 54 inches then. So Double Tough was 54 inches. He wasn't 56 inches like today's limit. So Doc decided to breed, start breeding more mares once they owned Double Tough. You know, a lot of people don't realize this because the Doc's prefix became so big, but Doc actually bred for Warrior Shamrock and Warrior's Pat Pending in the 60s. Uh, they were full brothers by P. Bar J. Bubbles. Uh, one was born in 67, and Pat Pending was born in 68. Uh, they both became well-known POA. Shamrock really did. I think he's a supreme champion. I'm pretty sure he is. Pat Pending, I believe, was uh, stood for a while as a stallion. And they're both by Ladies Warrior, as I mentioned earlier, Doc. That's who he went to at first. Uh, but by the mid-70s, he invested in East Acres Double Tough and decided to build a mare band around him. And one thing I like about Doc, he would write his ups and downs in ads and in articles. Like later when Double Tough passed away, there's a treasure trove of information there. Doc just kind of poured his heart out on the pages of the POA magazine. I'm sure he was still hurting at the time uh, because of the loss of this great stallion at the age of 12. And, uh, but he mentioned how he culled his mares. He had 16 mares, and uh, at first some of the mares' uh, babies went over height, and he just kept culling about four a year, 25%, which would be close to four a year, until he felt like he had a group of mares uh, that would throw color with double tough and also stay in the height limit. And as time has shown, uh, that worked pretty well. Here's one of the Double Tough offspring. This is Doc's Double Take. Uh, this would be 79. Uh, 1979 was a big year for Doc. He had uh, two stud colts that went on to be legendary stallions, but this filly here uh, did well at the sale, and uh, she went back east. Uh, forgive me right now. I can't come up with the names, but hopefully somebody watching can. Uh, we have quite a few people uh, watching tonight, so that's good. Hopefully more people tune in. And, uh, of course, you can always watch it any time after tonight, but it is fun to comment uh, live. So this mare here played a big part in Doc's program in several different ways, and this is Lammer's Whiskey. And uh, in 1974, Doc bred Lammer's Whiskey to a corridor stallion named Puff Man, and uh, he was a son of Spotted Puff. He was a, a quarter horse stallion. And out came a solid bay filly, in 75 that Doc named Doc's Miss Puff. And she would kind of set a trend that Doc would use for his whole, kind of the hallmark of his breeding program. He didn't dump his solids. If they were built right and good temperament and stuff and he liked them, he would use his solid fillies as broodmares. And we're all glad he did because Doc's Miss Puff ended up having um, two famous sons and then she had a couple daughters that did well. And we'll talk about those here in a minute. Uh, then he bred Lammer's Whiskey in 1976 to Double Tough, and the result was uh, Doc's Tough Cookie. And here he is. Of course, he's a Hall of Famer, premier sire. At one sale in Tulsa one year, three of the top ten foals, or POAs, they weren't foals, uh, were by him, were his uh, sons and daughters, so that's pretty cool. Doc actually uh, got him back for a while and bred some mares to him. His good friend Harper Krupp in Ohio uh, had Doc's took Tough Cookie almost all his life, I believe, and I think Doc sold him as a baby, but he did use him. That's another thing Doc would use stallions that he bred 
was the breeder of. He'd go haul mares or lease them back, and um, especially with the double tough bloodline. So this little guy right here is Doc's tough dude, and I always had a fondness for Doc's tough dude. I just uh, loved him as a POA stallion, looking at him in the magazines, and then later I got to see him in st on Stallion Row, and then several times in Dubuque at Doc's place. And uh, I'd never seen him as a baby, of course. Uh, we weren't in POAs yet then. But this little baby would turn out to be a four-time national champion four years in a row. He was born in 79, so he won his yearling class as pictured here in Syracuse. There's Doc at the lead shank. He was the yearling champion and the reserve grand champion, uh, stallion as a yearling. And, uh, and then he won on, went on to win as a two-year-old but he got beat out for junior and reserve as a two-year-old. Then as a three- and four-year-old, he won his class and was the grand champion stallion both those years. And uh, that's at a time that not a lot of stallions were repeating. And, of course, his sire had won four times in a row in the 70s. So that was a big mark for Double Tough to uh, 74 through 78 and then turn around and have a son do it in 82 and 83. This is one of the most famous pictures of a Doc's Tough Dude, sorry I cut his nose off here, but this was taken in Wisconsin, and uh, he's a late yearling here. Again, this horse didn't get over 54 inches, so he was his sire was a hardship Appaloosa Pony Cross, double tough, and his mother was out of Lammers Whiskey and by a quarter horse. And you can just see those horse genes there. That's pretty modern uh, for 19. This picture was taken in late 1980. A lot of neck, a lot of uh, confirmation and class in that yearling right there. Again, he could only grow up to be 54 or under, which he did. Here he is as a three-year-old. This is out in Estes Park, Colorado. This is when he won grand for the first time, and they did a pretty big photo shoot out there. Some of these pictures are not the best of dude, even though they were professional pictures, but I like the pictures of Doc, so I included him. Um, Doc didn't show a lot he showed some you know his kids showed early on and then in the 80s he showed for a while and then in the 90s he had people kind of help him out and show and stuff uh, but he did show his homebred here doc stuff dude and here he is at the 83 international show this would be the last year he won his class so he was uh, four years old in this picture and you can see he's in pretty good shape there now dude became a famous sire for a couple reasons. One, because he was just a good horse. And two, uh, in 1982, Double Tough fell gravely ill in early 82, and they had a lot of mares to breed to Double Tough of their own. Nemers had their mares of their own and a lot of outside commitments. Well, Dude was already a two-time champion, so some of the people bred to him as a three-year-old, and that kind of really jump-started his career. So uh, the second place filly, at the first for charity ever was Doc's first lady, and she's a daughter of uh, Doc's tough dude. Tom Victory, I believe, is the rider who went, and went on to do great things with uh, Doc's first lady. And then uh, over the years, dude had quite a few place in the for charity. And then his son ended up uh, siring two winners in the same year. We'll talk about that in a minute. So here's John, the youngest numbers son on dude i don't think they showed dude a lot in performance double tough they did he was only 182 or 187 points something like that away from being a supreme champion he lacked that few uh, game points of course he had his rom halter and rom uh, non-time but he was just a few points shy when he passed away at an early age uh, and of course he didn't start showing under saddle until the mid 70s he was six or so so when he started showing so in 1979, Doc had two stud colts born uh, on his place in Dubuque, Iowa. That would change the path of POAs. And one was Doc's Tough Dude that we just showed a bunch of pictures of. And the other one was this leopard, Doc's Tough Tiger. They both became well-known show horses and sires. Tough Tiger became a supreme champion. Of course, the Sweets and uh, Tracy Keene and her family, the Bolvin family from... Uh, the Northwest, and then they moved to Florida. They had Doc's Tough Tiger, bought him as a three-year-old at the sale from Olin Ziegler. Olin had purchased him from Doc as a baby or a yearling. Uh, this horse was actually 
second and reserve junior in Syracuse, New York, two dude. So the two Colts that Doc had were first and second as a yearling. And Doc wrote in one of those articles I was talking about, right or wrong, he decided to keep one of them, and he kept dude over Tiger. Tiger went on to be a premier sire, select sire, faturity uh, sire twice uh, in 83 and 89. And then, of course, dude became a Hall of Famer. And uh, he said he just he was glad he did keep one of them because when Double Tough uh, became ill, he fell back on dude. If he wouldn't have had dude, he would have been in a rough situation. So um, he learned his lesson there. And if you know Doc over the last 20, 30 years or more, he always had a backup stay. And he had a young stay in the wings uh, to take the senior stay in spot. And that all happened because of Double Tough's illness. So here's a 1981 Colt. This is a full brother to Doc's Tough Dude, and this is Doc's Built Tough. And he won the International as a baby and then as a yearling. Uh, he did go over the 54-inch limit, but when it changed, when he was still a young stallion, he was back in because he was under 14 hands. And, uh, of course, he sold for a lot of money as a baby to the Koroleski family through the sale. Doc believed in the international sale as a way to promote his babies and his get uh, change his brood mares around. And he also would buy mares at the sale or young stock to put in his program. Always a big supporter of the sale. He wrote about it that why would you drive all around the country when you could go to one place and uh, pick out the stock there. So built tough, of course. Uh, was gilded later on and became a, a supreme champion uh, gilding. Full brother to dude. And then they had a full sister, two of them. Doc's wipeout was the last cross of the double tough um, Doc's Miss Puff cross. She was born in 82, a year after this colt. She had a lot of chrome on her as well. She was solid and then had a lot of chrome. That's why Doc named her wipeout. She went on to produce some babies. Marcy Merrill had her for a while, and she had some, some show babies. And then, of course, the first cross of Double Tough and Doc Smith's Puff was a solid filly in 1978 named Doc's Double Sweet. And Doc's Double Sweet should be in the Hall of Fame, but she was solid. Now I guess you can allow that, so she might get in there. And, uh, of course, she's the mother to the Crisco Kid, who became the winningest gilding of all time, winningest POA of all time at the National Show in Congress. And then she was the mother to Doc's Bold Prince, the supreme champion by Gold Prince. Uh, just as tough, a tough plotted son that Doc hauled her out to South Dakota and George Bishop bought him for three grand in 1983. And then uh, she also produced a full sister to the Crisco Kid who became the mother of the Silver Kid. So when she was crossed with Kiddo Tough and then that cross went on to Avatar and that's how the Silver Kid happened. So a lot of performance genes there and that goes back to Doc adding that quarter horse and then crossing it on Double Tough. So again, he wasn't afraid to keep solid mares. Now this guy here is JBJ's Totally Tough with Jackie Guthrie. Jackie bought Tika's Miss Silhouette from Doc. She was in full. She fold out JBJ's Totally Tough. Of course, it was the 80s, so that was a cool name. Totally awesome, totally rad, all that kind of stuff. And uh, he was a few spot. He's the full brother to Tiger. And she did good things with Totally Tough. He ended up siring uh, some champions, and he became a national champion uh, stallion himself, as you see here. This would be when he was a three-year-old in 1984 at the Des Moines, Iowa National Show. So this is an 83 uh, Doc's Tough Dude filly, and she would go on to be a Hall of Famer. This is Doc's Foxy Lady. And of course, Doc's Foxy Lady won as a yearling. The Reeks purchased her for 2100 as a baby. I'm pretty sure she topped the sale that year in Des Moines. Uh, and then uh, Sarah Reeks won quite a bit of stuff with her as a junior mare. And then she went on and showed with other people, and she found herself in Indiana with Denny and Rini Brown. And uh, Denny and Rini is one of our sponsors tonight. They're an ROM sponsor in the memory of Doc's Foxy Lady. That's her on the right. Uh, she's buried on their farm out there, uh, DNR Farm in Indiana. And uh, this is Travis and Alicia Fortune. Of course, this is their niece and nephew. Uh, Alicia, they're both grown up now. She has, I think, like three kids. 
And uh, Travis is a professor at Murray State. I believe he's in the head of the equine program there, doing great things. And uh, Danny and Rini uh, raised them up in POAs, and they always had good POAs to show, as you see here, KS's Tiger Elegant Lady and Doc's Foxy Lady. So national champion in halter, national champion in pleasure, and then she became, um, I believe, a supreme champion and for sure uh, Hall of Fame inductee as well. So thank you, Danny and Rini. Here's a POA Doc raised that wasn't by his uh, by Double Tough, but he was around that generation, Doc City Slicker. And I apologize, I forget this girl's name, but I remember looking at this. I think it was a back cover or inside back cover. It was a very neat ad. It might have even been the front, uh, but just one of the cool ads that appeared in the POA magazine over the years. And uh, again, this was Doc's City Slicker. And that leads us to, we have another sponsor tonight. Like I say, a lot of people wanted to be part of this show. And uh, we want to thank Lexi Lou Designs. Look at some of these uh, ads she's created for POA people already. We got the Grand Champion Mayor there, Joyride, and Dr. Chocolate, who we're going to talk about more later, and then some RYs and, and stuff. And she just does a great job there out of Arizona. Uh, special value is... Uh, it's till November 1st. She's run a special buy one, get one half off on a full page advertisement. When you mentioned that you saw this ad on Black Hand and Beyond, how do you like that? So that's pretty cool. Thanks, Lexi, for doing that. Uh, she's a very talented designer, and uh, she's going to be a Supreme Champion sponsor here for the Mike Gardner episode, uh, Gardner Family, in December. So we look forward to learning more about her. But please take advantage of this uh this opportunity here she does really great ads especially with uh, tammy verzi's year-end magazine coming up uh, beat that deadline and have lexi lou do a design for you all right let's get back into some of doc stuff so getting personal a little bit um, in the 1980s and the early 80s it was a little rough on the nemers family uh, double tough fell ill like i said in 82 uh, the youngest of the Nemers kids were starting to age out of POAs, and Doc and his uh, first wife, Jen, were about ready to get a divorce. And, you know, a lot of people could have just possibly quit on POAs. You know, he could have bought a boat. He could have did a thousand things, right? He could have went into a different breed that his kids hadn't shown. Uh, he could have raised chickens, whatever, you know. But he stuck in POAs, and... Uh, Ended up moving to Hazel Green, Wisconsin, and building a place from scratch. And uh, he remarried, uh, I believe, in the late 80s to Ruth Ann. A lot of people from the last 20, 30 years know Ruth Ann very well. She took a big part in the program. And uh, they kind of just reinvented themselves as POA breeders and just kept breeding the same great docs he had been. And uh, Docs Rough and Tough was born in 1989. He came up to our place uh, when I was a teenager and took a look at Kiddo Tough, decided he wanted to uh, lease Kiddo, which he bred four mares to him in Dubuque in uh, 88, and one of them fold this horse here, Doc's Rough and Tough. Uh, he slipped through the sale for 825. You know, he's a beautiful colored guy, but he was little. He was a little baby. Now, his mother is a cool story, and I... Uh, encountered Doc about this point blank. I put him on the spot when I was about 15. What Doc did was when Double Tough died, he decided to concentrate on the Double Tough blood. He, uh, he really wanted, he didn't want to give it up, you know, so he wanted to line breed it a little bit. And, uh, but he also wanted to keep improving the breed by adding horses to it. So he had a quarter horse mare and she was a Zippo Pine Bar Skips Brick bred mare. And he bred her to a solid son of Double Tough that he had for a while because he went out and bought some sons of Double Tough when Double Tough died. And uh, this little stud was one of them. And he knew he was going to get a solid full, but there was a loophole at the time, and he did it to help close the loophole because Doc was very much for colored POAs. Uh, but he kept that mare. It, became a, it was a filly, Doc's Double Zip, and she was a great-looking mare. Uh, today's standards maybe could have used a little more neck, but everything else was just great, way ahead of her time. And when he crossed her as a two-year-old to Kiddo Tough, this was the result, Doc's Rough and Tough. 
And of course, Dean bought this Colt for eight twenty-five uh, in Iowa. Uh, one of the bargains ever at the sale. Ended up standing grand as a yearling and grand as a two-year-old with him. He never did bring him back as a small stay into the national show, but he did as a four-year-old to the world show in Iowa, in Waterloo, and he won the small stay in Class Easy. But he never did show him, and then as a small stay at the national show. Of course, Doc's Rough and Tough went on to be one of the best uh, Doc sires of all times, right up there with Tough Dude. And uh, Doc himself bred to him uh, many times. And um, this cross produced, was crossed again, and a solid filly came out, and she ended up having enough white to register, barely. But he named her Doc's Alter Tough. She was going to be shorter than uh, Rough and Tough. I seen her as a two-year-old. Beautiful filly, long neck and beautiful headed. And it just didn't have the flash that her full brother did. Unfortunately, like a lot of breeders, if you have that many horses over the years, you're going to have tragedies. And Doc lost her at a young age. And then he ended up uh, rough and uh, zips or rough and tough's mother Doc's double zip she passed away at a fairly young age too I think he got four or five babies from her uh, her and snowstorm had some loud colored babies uh, that I know one of them was the Kennedy's bot showed him as a gilding uh, but here's an adult picture of rough and tough of course he's in the Hall of Fame helped give a lot of wins to the uh, Damon family there in Iowa Here's another uh, late 80s horse uh, that Doc bred. Doc's tough dude bred, I think Snowcap's tattoo was this guy's mother. Doc's fancy dude. Uh, Marcy had him for a while too. Marcy Kruger, Marcy Merrill. And uh, he had him in the late 80s and bred some mares. That's his new place in Hazel Green there, uh, which they just sold this year now. Uh, but that was Doc's fancy dude. And then Doc, he, you know, he. He fell for the few spot hard. He had Double Tough for a long time, who was a pretty good color producer, but he wasn't homozygous by any means. And then he had Dude, who was half, his mother was half quarter horse, so Dude was half solid on one side. Well, he bought Piece of Cake at the national sale one year, and she was a tough plotted daughter out of uh, Crazy Alice, uh, H. H. Cherokee's Crazy Alice, I believe was her full name. And, uh, he bred piece of cake to Doc's tough dude, and out come Doc's big time dude. Now there was one before this, Doc's showtime dude, who passed away, I believe, as a baby. He was really flashy. He would have made a great show horse, uh, but you know, a tragedy struck, and they lost him as a baby. So when dude was born, he never showed big time dude. I seen him as a baby, and I tell you what, this he was something else as a baby. So he never got him in show shape. This is just breeding shape. And look at that big full tail. And that neck wasn't sweated on or anything like that. He, but I seen him live as a weanling on Doc's place, uh, the Dubuque place still. And uh, he, he was a uh, wide boy. He was a good looking baby. And he ended up taking Doc's program in a whole nother direction. Uh, Doc even advertised in the Quarter Horse Journal, started buying quarter horse mares you gotta remember he started out breeding when it was 54 so now he had the opportunity to put more horse blood than ever when it was 14 hands and he took advantage of that and he you would go to doc's house at this time in the 90s and he'd have stacks of quarter horse pedigrees and pictures from all over the country on his desk and uh, i knew transporters that hauled some in for him we hauled some in for him my dad and i as transporters and uh, they just, he brought them to this few spot stallion. And in uh, 1997, I believe it was, he won both ends of the Futurity. One with a Doc's impressive lorry uh, full, and the other one was out of uh, Doc's big time, uh, or, or Catsy Jack, a daughter of, uh, yeah, Catsy Jack was her name. And uh, he bred big time to them and got Doc's big time Jack was the Colt, and then uh, the filly that won, let's see, I probably got her name down. Ten years ago, I would have just rattled it off, but uh, I'm getting tired. <laughs> Doc's Conclusive Miss. Tracy probably beat me to it, but Doc's Conclusive Miss won in 97, and her half-brother Doc's Big Time Jack, who was out of a quarter mare, won. Uh, and then I think it was the next year he had uh, the Designamite mare, 
had a colt in uh, Cecil Loft and bought him, I think, for like seventy-two fifty or something like that. And that kind of started. Doc had a string of high-selling colts for a while. Of course, 1995, he had Doc's uh, Tough Mister was the high-selling uh, Weanling of all time, twelve thousand two fifty. We'll see a picture of him. He was by Tough Dude, and one of his last Tough Dudes before he started using big time, really heavy. And there he is, right there, Doc's Tough Mister. So just in in time. So Junior Reams purchased him again. Tragedy struck, and he didn't live very long after the sale. But that doesn't take away that he was a beautiful baby. He did well at the Midwest for charity. I think he won it, and then he went to the international. The charity select sire and got the gate. People thought he was gonna, they were gonna steal him and he was gonna go for three or four thousand, which was still a lot of money back then for a baby. And he ended up uh, selling for twelve thousand two fifty. Like I say, setting the all-time record at the time, and that was pretty much the towards the end of Doc's tough dude's career because he started using big time dude. Another stallion he used for a while, again, because he liked few spots, he went down to Texas and got CHR Tiger's Tough Eagle. This is one of the full brothers that Tommy Tomlin produced out of the great cross of Pal Chip and Putt and K, K's Rio Tough. Uh, and he was a little few spot. This is when he consigned him to a sale up in Wilmer, Minnesota. My dad and I put on a production sale in 04 and 06. In 06, Doc had had some bad luck with some mares and stuff, and he didn't consign anything. So when we did it the next time, he consigned this guy and had him looking really sharp. And then he consigned this mare, Doc's perpetual talker. And let me tell you, this picture doesn't do her justice. He had to take that in the winter, basically. It was starting to get green, but the sale was Mother Day, Mother's Day weekend, so early May. And uh, a good friend of mine that we had bought some Appaloosas from and bred to one of his stallions, uh, he was at the sale just attending it because he was a friend of ours and he was the contending bidder on both these two on him and this mare and he didn't plan to start a POA breeding program which he didn't but he was so impressed by these two that Doc brought in and this mare her forearms were so big some of the biggest forearms I ever seen and she was in full at the time I've told this story on here before when I had Levi on and Tommy uh, one of my first episodes this year, uh, Tommy Tomlin, of course, Levi from Wisconsin. And this is Levi here, and this is perpetually tipped. And in that picture I just shown, he was, this POA was in her belly. And uh, he became one of Doc's greatest winners. So he won a lot of national titles, just a beautiful gilding. And he's the cross between the two I just showed, Tough Eagle, Eagle and Perpetual Talker. And if you look at that pedigree on perpetual talker, perpetualism is uh, her granddam or grandsire. So Doc bought I'm Perpetual Motion, and then he raised some foals out of her. So another example of how Doc used great horse bloodlines, and usually he he liked modern bloodlines. He liked three bars and all that stuff, you know, that changed the quarter horse. But he also liked the modern hot bloodlines, and he would do that throughout his career would add in great quarter horse bloodlines. All right, so we're gonna take a little sponsor break right now. I hope you're enjoying this show. I see a lot of people are commenting, Doug Sorrell, Jan Rogers, Tracy. I can't keep looking down all the time, but I'm sure you're having a great conversation amongst yourself. Hopefully you're enjoying episode 45, a tribute to Doc Nemers. Our sponsor, first uh, Supreme sponsor tonight is Bruns Performance Horses. Here's their setup at the national show, in a, or for charity. And here she is, Sammy Bruns grew up in POAs, just like her mother and her aunt. She's starting a young family in Iowa. She's one of the hot trainers going right now, but she still has some spaces available. Uh, contact her while you can. You know, she grew up in POAs. There she is as a POA uh, youth. She showed a variety of POAs, just like her mom and aunt did. And uh, that gave her a lot of experience, too, showing different types of POAs. Uh, she's done a good job for everybody she's training for up there in uh, northern Iowa. And she will show other breeds, too. Here's her connection to the night. She showed uh, this horse here, which is uh, Eagles View Chocolate Tea. And he's by Doc's Chocolate Impulse that we're going to talk about was part of Doc's later 
uh, career towards the twilight of his breeding program. So Sammy showed him a while back. And like I say, just contact her. She's on Facebook, social media. Just look her up, give her a call. She's got really good rates. And uh, like I say, she can help you turn a program around. These days, it's so competitive out there. Uh, you need a good trainer in your corner. And uh, Bruns Performance Horses is one of those trainers that will help you out. Our next Supreme sponsor tonight is fittingly Dr. Chocolate. Dr. Chocolate, if you didn't know, was uh, the last colt that's standing right now to be bred on Doc Nemmer's farm. He wasn't bred by Doc. He was bred by C. Hafer Performance Horses of Wisconsin, but they hauled a mare uh, to Doc and Ruth Ann's place and the bred to his young stallion, Doc's Chocolate Impulse, and the result was Dr. Chocolate. This guy won the Futurity unanimously in 2020 as a yearling. Here's a good picture of him, just kind of a farm fresh picture. Maine's not banned or anything. I just love this picture though, because look at how he profiles. He reminds me of a rock star in color, uh, but he might even do more than that as a sire in the POA breed. I'm not sure if he's the only son of Doc's Chocolate Impulse standing. Nikki might say that on here, but I know he was one of the last foals conceived on the Nemmer's place. Uh, he's just a good looking rascal. Here he is again as a yearling. And of course, sea heifers promote their stuff. They're not standing him to the public right now, but they're breeding mares to him. And she's got a great uh, young breeding program up there. She has a quarter horse and buckskin background. So you know she knows horses and uh, her daughter as well, her oldest daughter helping her out. So uh, they promote their stuff. If you buy something from them, you know you're gonna have the backing of a good breeder that's gonna uh, have your back when you show it and try to promote it and resell it someday once you've trained it. So Dr. Chocolate from the top side from the Nemers breeding program and look for his baby soon coming out of Wisconsin. Thank you to CA for Performance Horses for the sponsorship with Dr. Chocolate. So speaking of the young stallion Doc's Chocolate Impulse, there he is. He's not young anymore. He passed away, unfortunately. He was an 09. He just passed away recently. And uh, here he is as a baby on the Nemers farm. And like I say, this was kind of the twilight of Doc's breeding program. He retained him and another 09 Colt, um, Doc's Diamond Dude, who we'll see here in a minute too. Both great individuals, kind of in two separate ways. Uh, both halter and performance, but of course this guy was a lot of performance, as his pedigree shows, chocolate and impulse. I asked Doc one time, why didn't you name him Doc's uh, Dark Chocolate, because he ended up so dark. and You know, he wanted to get that pedigree in there, Doc's Chocolate impulse so uh, Doc had several first impulse foals over the years he bred to Leo and Leanne's uh, groundbreaking impulse uh, a son impulse son first impulse of course he won a lot as a two-year-old changed the industry for Western pleasure horses and POAs and Doc bred to him and my dad was on his place uh, one year and he called me he hauled a mare in there and he said Doc's got two daughters of Leo and Leanne stud and he said, one's taller and one's really short. And he said, they're both great mares. I think they were two at the time. He said, but I'd take the short one. Well, the short one was Doc's on an impulse and she's the mother uh, to this colt. Of course, Doc took her and bred her to the uber popular, ever famous Chocolatey, who wasn't famous as a stallion yet because Doc was the first POA person to ever breed to him. And uh, now, of course, he's owned by a POA person. He's had a lot of POAs year after year, and uh, he's burned up the charts quickly, and he's in the top 10. He might even be in the top five of sires of all time in the POA breed for national champions. Of course, that's at the international show or the Congress now, and uh, this was his first son in POAs, and it was because of Doc Nemers. He took the chance and bred to him, and he got a POA with color that stayed in height, and there he is on the cover in 2010, Doc's Chocolate Impulse. And here's one of my personal stories. I'm in Oklahoma, had just been here probably four or five months, 
I'm in a tractor owned by Lynn Puffenbarger, another famous Hall of Fame breeder. I'm working for Lynn, disc in a field, and I get a call on my flip phone. I flip it open, and it's Ruth Ann Nemers. And she said, Doc's birthday's coming up, and we want to do a tribute to him. We have the front cover, and I need a cover story. Could you help us out? So I wrote this. I got off the tractor that night, went home, typed this up. I'm kind of proud of this cover story. There's a nice picture of Doc there, and then the, the young colt. There's a sire and dam. Doc's on an impulse on the left, and, of course, chocolatey on the right. And if you have this magazine, this is the cover. Check it out. It's August of 2010. Doc's birthday is in August, I believe. And uh, it just turned out to be a nice cover and a nice cover story. So here he is uh, when Doc took him out later as an aged horse. Uh, Courtney, who has CEO performance horses in Wisconsin, uh, she showed him for Doc. He did well at the Futurities. Uh, there, see that dark color I'm talking about? Some people this last week seen him for the first time, some newer people, and thought he was black. Of course, he's red-based. He's not even bay or brown. He's red-based, chestnut. Uh, but he's just so shiny, and he had that little bitty head for being uh, so much horse breeding. Uh, just a tiny, unique head. And then, of course, his performance ability. There, some people commented this week that the, it was the greatest lope they ever seen was this horse when they seen him show at the Futurities as, what was he, probably four. He was a four-year-old in these pictures. So, Doc's birthday is in June. Okay, well, then Ruth was a few months late, but <laughs> she probably called me in June, Jackie. So, Jackie Guthrie, no, Jackie's birthday, I think, is in August. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jackie Guthrie. Uh, here's one of the foals. Uh, of course, he was nicknamed Batman, but this is Jenna's uh, daughter. And this is Doc's Chocolate Delight, I believe. He's won a lot of titles lately, as you can see by all these trophies here. And uh, he's a pleasure to watch, too. He's a little guy. You know, he kind of took after his uh, grand dam and stuff. Again, a lot of horse breeding, uh, but he's still a little guy. But he's just a, in nine and under, he's tough to beat. And uh, got that nice coloring. He'd be one of Doc's later champions. So here's the other stallion that I was talking about was born the same year, kind of eerily, like 1979, how Doc had uh, Doc's Tough Dude and Doc's Tough Tiger born, born the same year and both became uh, good stallions. Well, he had Doc's Chocolate Impulse and this guy here, Doc's Diamond Dude, born in 2009. So a lot of years later, uh, what's that, 40 years later? Uh, but Doc's Diamond Dude, he ended up selling and because uh, he went with the chocolate stud. Uh, but he grew up to be a very nice horse. Uh, Sean Weist in California, I believe, still has him as a gilding. Here he is in kind of breeding shape. Again, Doc never showed this horse. I always liked him. I thought he could have been fitted up as a young stallion to do some great things in halter. Again, here he is in breeding shape. Doc consigned him to the international sale, even though he hadn't promoted him. He was kind of in the shadows of Chocolate Impulse, but he, he loved the sale and loved to promote it, so that's where, where he sold him. So here's another one uh, uh, Courtney had of Doc's. And let's see who this is. Somebody might beat me to it. But anyway, somebody might know who this is. Courtney, this is, I think, a yearling. She's showing it here. I think attraction's in the name. Uh, Doc did breed to Touch a Sudden. He bred to Max Good and Plenty. Uh, quite a few quarter horses uh, through that time, and he kept some of the sons. He had Doc's uh, Sudden Impact was one of the sires he raised. Doc's All the Extras was out of a quarter horse mare he had. And then uh, who else did he keep? Uh, let's see. Of course, the two we're talking about. Now, this filly here, this is Doc's Sudden Attraction. I believe she's an 07, and she ended up the mother to quite a few good ones that are around the country. I think Chuck and Maxine Sheckleton have one of them, uh, one of Doc's last broodmares. And then she's the mother to this guy here, the Chocolate Doctor. You know, our sponsor tonight is Dr. Chocolate. Well, this is another one once removed from Doc's. His, uh, He's a chocolatey, 
But then the mother was born on Doc's place, bred by him and Ruth Ann, that filly right here, uh, Doc's sudden attraction. Going back to this colt right here, he's a grandson of Doc's rough and tough. And like I said, Doc would go breed to some of the POAs that he had sold. He sold rough and tough as a baby, and he bred to him a few times, of course. And one of the colts he got was a few spot sire to this baby here, which was Doc's Rough and Zip. And if you're paying attention, Doc's Rough and Zip's been getting it done for a lot of years now. He's already 23 years old. He's still going strong. And he's one of our sponsors tonight. He's our last ROM sponsor. Chuck and Maxine Shingleton from Iowa uh, with Clay Hill POAs. You all re recognize the Clay Hill uh, name. And the horse that's been doing it for a long time for him is the Few Spot Stallion Doc's Rough and Zip. Of course, Doc Scotch to Zip is the mother, few spot mare that sold for a lot of money and had some famous POAs, and then the sire was uh, Rough and Tough. So just like Doc went and bred to Rough and Tough, he also went to Shackleton's and bred to Rough and Zip, and one of the crosses he got was Doc's Diamond Dude. Of course, Janelle Burton's done great things with Rough and Zip babies as well as other people, but she's won the Futurity now. And, Grand Champions, and she's just piling up the wins uh, with his stuff, especially out of Petra. So, uh, Caitlin Dickman sent me some cool pictures. She's owned quite a few docks over the years. Here's Doc's Tough Zippo in 07 Gilding. And uh, there you see Doc's All the Extras and Doc's Zip to Scotch uh, was the parents on this. So, All the Extras Doc kept for a few years as a stallion. I believe he was loud colored. And then here's another one. This is the stallion. I couldn't remember his name. Doc's Good and Tough. He's by Max Good and Plenty. And uh, then Doc's Honky Talk Lil was by Doc's Diamond Lil, uh, who's the mother to that snow cap we just seen a while back. And uh, she was a great leopard mare that did a lot of great things for Doc. Bo's my daddy, Bloodlines, and uh, Two-Eyed Jack in the background. And uh, so this was Doc's Good and Plenty. He was a grand champion gilding, 2010 gilding. You also see some of the titles he won there uh, for Caitlin. And you see an older picture of him down below. And then here's Doc's Extra Impact. I love this color, the blaze and the chrome. Doc wasn't always, uh, didn't always love a lot of chrome, but he ended up getting them just how he bred some horses. And, you know, it just comes with the app gene sometimes. And it produces a very nice looking POA though I think and again this is Doc's Extra Impact No 08 Mare by Doc's Sudden Impact I know uh, the Damons have had quite a few brood mares by him they used him for a while Doc's So Special was a really good brood mare uh, you see here they bought her at the 08 sale and uh, she become the dam of Batgirl by Batman the AQHA famous stallion and then I'm a Little White Lie by I'm a Few Spot Dream is one of her foals. This is him here. Of course, Charlie Phillips and his wife in Iowa are starting to do good things with him. Uh, he had a filly, I think, reserved this year at the Futurity at the Select Sire. So he's a young Few Spot uh, to watch. So I'm not sure what time it is, but I didn't want to rush through all this. But like I say, I could talk about all kinds of docs. I didn't have a bunch of pictures. I did have a bunch of pictures. I had 300 pictures I could have used tonight, if not more. Uh, but I didn't use them all. We're not done, by the way, so don't tune off. We still got a lot to talk about. But uh, I just want to talk about some of the fillies and different things that Doc bred for over the years. Uh, at one time in the 1980s, I believe it was eight or nine years in a row, uh, a double tough granddaughter won the yearling filly class at the national show. Isn't that something? And three of them were Doc's Sugar Babe in 82, Doc's Foxy Lady in 1983, and Doc's Hmm Baby, I believe in 89, 88 or 80, I think 89. She just made the decade there and uh, won. So three Doc bred yearling fillies won in the 80s. And then, of course, he had Rough and Tough was a two-time Grand Champion Stallion. Dude was a two-time Grand Champion Stallion. He's got a Grand Champion gilding. And it's ironic that he hasn't had a Grand Champion mare because some of his horses have produced Grand Champion mares, uh, like 
uh, blame it on the chocolate is a full sister to uh, the chocolate doctor and she's a grand champion mayor out in Michigan there. So, and then this Colt, you know, here's a great picture. Unfortunately, a lot of the people in this picture have passed. You have the pedigree reader there from Minnesota. That's Roger Hendricks. Uh, and then Linda's the handler. She conditioned this Colt and that started, uh, she'd conditioned a few for doc before this, but she conditioned a lot for him after that. And, uh, in the background there, you have two tall gentlemen, Jerry King and Ken Steele. Ken Steele's on this side of the rail. Jerry's on the other one, both in their black cowboy hats. They have both passed away. Uh, Doug Sorrell's still ticking and watching tonight. He's in the picture. Of course, the famous auctioneer did a great job for POA for 25 years. Uh, somebody put bubble wrap around Doug so we can keep him around. He sent me this picture. Doc was proud of this price, $12,250. It was a very legitimate deal. Two groups of people just started bidding against each other. And, you know, a colt like this will do it. Loud colored, beautiful colt. And uh, he sent this picture to Doug, autographed it, said, thanks, Doug. $12,250 right on that rail. I just think that's a cool picture. Of course, this is Jock's Chocolate Impulse uh, after Doc sold him down at the Pony Farm. Uh, this up-close picture of his head, isn't that an unusual, unique head, though? Very small, unique head for a horse dad. Chocolate, he's not real short. And then, of course, impulse on the bottom. So he had some short quarter horse on the bottom, but he had as much horse blood as POA blood, if not more. And uh, it's a shame he didn't last a little longer, but Doc did do some great things with him. And, uh, you know, some of the grand champions they had over the years was Joe Barr, as we mentioned before. They had Salty Apple, was a grand champion. And then, uh, you know, he bred the High Plains Drifter over the years. I didn't mention him. He beat Dude uh, the one time in 81 when he stood grand as a yearling. Uh, he beat Dude out for that. And uh, Doc bred to him. High Plains Heat Wave he purchased from Marlene Borjon, and she ended up being bred to the Zip to Scotch horse at Crown Center Farms. And that caused a lot of different things in POAs, great things. That's where Rough and Zip's related to that. And a lot of uh, champions from Doc's program came from that cross. So Doug Sorrell saying, is 12250 still the auction record from 1985? For, I believe it is. I believe it is. And I think 72-something second. I may be wrong there if people that attended the sale. I haven't attended a sale since... Uh, 2009, Doug, but I follow it pretty close. Of course, it ended in 19, and uh, thanks for mentioning that, Doug, because I want to show this catalog. This is the last year Doc consigned POAs to the sale that I know of, and this was 2016, and he consigned several to the sale like he always did, and I always remember Doug. Uh, Doc don't bring his POAs here to inventory him. You know, he sold his POAs. So, and that's right. He did, and he supported the sale year after year. Uh, some of the other docs we want to mention is, uh, of course, Doc Sugar Babe, I mentioned. She won as a yearling, became a champion with Stacy Dugard. Doc's Dandy Dude was a cross between one, two of their favorite uh, POAs that they had, Nemers. They had 7M's Warrior's Bonnet. She was a family favorite. And, of course, two-time grand champion mare before they purchased her. Then they bred her to their two-time grand champion homebred, Doc's Tough Dude. And Doc's Dandy Dude was the 82 result. And he ended up becoming a supreme champion at an early age. I believe Alan Hansen in Wisconsin did that. And then they retired him. They just kicked him out to the pasture. People tried to buy him for years, but they never let him go that I know of. Then he had a full brother named Doc's Dazzling Dude in 2000 or in 1983, few spot colt. I believe if Doc wasn't going through some things at the time, he might have kept him because of the two uh, favorite parents there. But he did sell him to the Heinrichs family, and they raised some champions uh, up in Cannon Falls, Minnesota, by Doc's Dazzling Dude. Uh, let's see here. What else do I got for you tonight? So again, emphasize Doc was the first person to breed to Chocolatey, uh, and that was in 2009. He was foaled, and that's this guy we're looking at right now. I started writing down all of the Doc's foals 
that he ever registered. And let me tell you, that's a lot. And I gave up after a while because I started getting cross-eyed. So I apologize I didn't make it to the 2000s. Uh, I gave up in the 90s. But Doc did keep breeding to a lot of different quarter horses. Um, I have a cool picture here. This is the way I get out of putting pictures just on. It's so tough to put pictures on here for the show sometimes. This is his sudden detour. She's an 09 filly, so she would have been born the same year as those two good colts, Diamond Dude and Chocolate Impulse. She was a nice looking filly. Doc was good friends with uh, Ruth Picoy. He bought some horses from her in, over the years, like Snowcaps Tattoo. He almost bought his fancy feather, the mare that made Ruth basically as a breeder, and especially in her later career. But he bought this filly because of her pedigree and just the way she looks. And uh, she was sired by suddenly a Sunny, and then a touch of velvet was her dam. But I believe Doc bred to almost all three of the. He either had foals by him or bred to all three of the sons that made a big impact by a sudden impulse. First impulse, a suddenly a sunny, and then the first impulse of uh, Stolies and Roselands. He had something to do with all three of them because he believed in that uh, bloodline, and he produced some really nice-looking POAs uh, by doing that. All right, so... Hopefully I did justice to the Nemers family. Doc, if you watch this, uh, I just want to thank you for being friends over the years. And uh, I want to tell this story. In 1983, my family had purchased some horses from Max Nebergall. You know, he's the man that sold Double Tough to Doc. And uh, we went to the 83 sale. That was our first sale. And we'd bought five mares that summer and then later bought East Acres Chippa Tough uh, from Max. In 85, Doc would come up to her place and, and bring Doc's tough dude's mother, Doc's Miss Puff, and breed her to Chippa Tough. Uh, anyway, in 83, I was helping Max. My mom and dad was at the sale, but I was 11 years old, lugging water buckets to the, his sales consignments. His grandson, uh, Ben, Benji at the time, was a little young to haul those heavy water buckets, and I was only 11. But... I remember after a water in Black Swan S, I come out and there's a gentleman standing in corduroy pants and a nice sweater. And Max introduces me just like I'm a 40 year old person. And I never forget the way Doc treated me. He didn't treat me like an 11 year old kid or the fact that we just got in POAs the year before. I can't remember the whole conversation, but Max was rattling off how my dad, Pat Rourke, had just bought Chip a Tough. And, of course, Doc was interested in him because he was a grandson of, of Double Tough through Tough to Beat. And, uh, you know, I think that helped me follow the Doc's bloodline and end up getting Dad and I getting uh, some of his stuff because just the way he treated me as a young man there, a young kid, 11 years old. And uh, that's how he always treated people, I believe. Uh, another quick story, Don and his daughter Jackie, who helped him out so much in the POA his breeding program. In 1985, my mom and dad had a mini mart and they were went to close it down. And uh, I was at home, so I would have been yeah, 13, going on 14, I guess. And the phone rings, green phone tethered to the wall. I pick it up and it's somebody I'd never talked to before. And her name was Jackie Nemers. And she found out we had a filly out of East Acres Arrow and by Chippetuff. And she wanted to know if we'd sell it. And, of course, we were just uh, starting to show her. That became Sandy Tough Dots. Uh, Dottie, as a lot of people know, supreme champion, national champion, uh, champion producer. And uh, Susie Schultz made her all that in Minnesota. And, anyway, Doc came up then to look at her because he'd had a full sister from Max, uh, one of Arrow's first babies, Arrow ended up being uh, probably a future Hall of Famer. She's a premier dam, and uh, she had foals by four different stallions, I believe, over the years or more, and uh, four national champions at least. And anyway, they'd lost their Arrow Chip a Tough cross they'd got from Max, so they came to look at ours. And I remember Dad saying, well, I'll sell you Arrow, because at the time she hadn't had 
Sandy wasn't famous yet. Ruby Tough Dots wasn't born. Susie Tough Dots wasn't born. And she had a, a baby, few spot colt on her side. And uh, Doc said, you keep the factory, Pat. Sell me the baby. So and that became Chips even tougher. They named him. They didn't put the Doc's prefix on him. Dad named him Sliver, but we never registered him. A chip, a chip and arrow. He said a chip out of an arrow is a sliver. And uh, anyway, Chip's even tougher. He ended up being shown. He was a probably a 53-inch few spot. Looked a lot like Kiddo, just a little not quite as smooth as Kiddo. They were three-quarter brothers. And uh, anyway, uh, I think that caused a, a lasting relationship. We went down to Doc's place. Uh, a little while later to pick out we traded for a mare uh, we go down there he had some tough dude and tough tiger yearlings in a pen and uh, some of them were solid and uh, no offense to doc but my dad was picky like doc was and he didn't didn't like any of them we started looking at the mares and i noticed double sweep and i recognized her from the sales catalog being the pedigree nerd i am and and junk sales catalog junkie i told doc find out who about her so Doc asked, and he goes, well, Pat, that's one of my best mares. And luckily, he sold her to us. I think Dad had to kick in a little. Doc said something about George Bishop, taught him, you always got to get a little on the trade. So I think it was like 50 bucks or maybe 500 I can't remember. I was a kid. Uh, but we took, uh, he wanted to keep her because she was going to have a baby. So we went down and picked her up the next spring. I don't think she had a baby then, but we picked her up then in March. And bred her to Chippa Tough a couple times. Got a couple nice ones. Tough guy was one of her babies that did some stuff. And then, of course, uh, the Crisco Kid and Kids Double Sweet came out of that cross that we bred. And uh, I would say even to this day, if you can get a Doc's mare, it's going to enhance your program. Doc's not breeding anymore, so it's not going to help him out. So I'm not, you know, doing an advertisement for him. But just you guys know if you're paying attention the docks mares out there and the stallions there's still some stallions around rough and tough we just lost but rough and zip still around and then the relatives like dr chocolate uh, if you can capture that pedigree and you look in those pedigrees you see those docks mares tracing on the female line sometimes four or five generations there's a reason why that stuff is good so again i want to uh, thank everybody for watching i'm going to look at a few comments here uh, Jackie Guthrie, Doc had more integrity in his little finger than some people have. <laughs> and, yeah, that's true. Uh, and uh, Tracy's writing a, a lot of stuff here. So, again, I want to thank everybody that sponsored tonight. Uh, that's the way I hope it would go when I started this 45 episodes ago. But this was our best show for sponsors. There's two Supreme sponsors each uh, episode which is $50 a piece, and then there's the ROM sponsors, which is just like you've seen tonight, a quick mention, and then maybe a one-page ad or a picture, and uh, that's only 20 bucks. and I do five of those an episode. This is the most I've ever had at three, and I only do two Supreme, so we just are not running an infomercial all night. So uh, next week is going to be a cool episode. Episode 46 is going to be the Art of the POA, and I do have... Uh, a sponsor on that I believe so I think uh, Lexi is the sponsor next week Lexi Lou but I do need some more sponsors so please contact me this runs forever on Facebook it's live right now I'm actually live here in Enid at this moment uh, but you can watch it forever on the POA history group eventually we will get these put to YouTube but for now Facebook seems to be a good platform uh, we have anywhere from 500 to we've had 4,000 views on some of these videos. So uh, it's a good opportunity to get the word out. So I see my wife is watching. So maybe supper's ready at home. I'm going to end this. Uh, thank you to Jackie Nemers for providing me stuff and uh, to Doc Nemers just for always treating me like a, an equal and uh, being a great POA breeder. So I hope you guys enjoyed tonight's show. I'm sure I forgot hours of stuff, but, you know, this we had to do it in a short little compact thing. So uh, tune in next Tuesday for the art of the POA. Good night, everyone.
one time you had 47 people watching. Oh, wow. I got a little emotional at the end, but I tried to hold it in. <laughs> it's, I think I did good. You did great, babe. Thanks. We're shut down on this. There it is. I'm shut down. It went way faster than I thought. That's why I'm afraid I missed a lot of stuff. But, you know, you can't, it's not a anthology. You know what I mean? It's. Right. Yeah. What's for supper? Um, I made me some chicken nachos because I was afraid there wasn't going to be enough meatballs. You're getting meatballs, teriyaki meatballs. <laughs> chicken. Teriyaki chicken meatballs. 